Ecclesiastes 6 in your Bible. We'll begin by reading the whole chapter. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Seeing there, may, seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? For who knoweth what is good for man in his life, in this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Uh, here we continue on in our study of Ecclesiastes. Um, Solomon here starts to explain an evil that is common among men. A common evil is what I've entitled this portion of the scripture uh, in the preaching. Uh, the common evil here is, is, what is harm and it is hurt. That's what evil is. Evil isn't always just, just that darkness or, or what have you. Evil in the simplest terms is, is a harm or is a hurt. That's why people will see God doing evil unto men and it's not sin, it's not wickedness. Evil is just harm and hurt. But this is a common hurt among men. Verse 1 says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. That's Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 1. Verse 2 says, A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it, this is vanity, and it is an evil disease, a hurtful, a harmful disease is this, that God would give that riches, God would give that wealth, God would give that honor unto a man, and the recipient would receive it, would, would embrace it, but he would not receive that same power that God giveth to enjoy it. I believe this is an offshoot of God's um, ability, or rather restricting his ability to get involved in the free will of mankind. What's happening here is that God hath given the riches, the wealth, and honor. He hath blessed that one that has received it, and yet, at the same time, though the man has a want of nothing, and all that he desireth has been given unto him, he has not received the power to eat thereof, but rather here, a stranger has partaken of it. If you look across the page, in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 18, it says this, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Not only here are the days the gift of God, but it is the good of all his labor received in a joyful spirit, received in such a way that it is good, it is comely to partake of it and to do it with joy. 
In verse 19, right below that, it says, Every man to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Again, showing that the reception of the gifts of God, the receiving and the rejoicing in the gifts of God, that is exactly what it is. It is a gift, and it is you partaking of the portion of which is your own labor. It's what you receive because of your own labor. Verse 24, He shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. And I, I talked last week about how there's not much reflection upon the days of your life because you're too busy living in the joy of your heart that you're experiencing right now. Life is full of ups and downs, but if we are able to receive of the gifts of God, embrace them and live in the joy of those in the moment that we are receiving them, then the remembrance of what has passed seems to uh, float away as you just embrace the joy of your heart and live presently in the moment that God hath given us. But in the context of Ecclesiastes chapter 6, we see the flip side of all this. The opposite is taking place where God hath not given the power to eat thereof, but rather a stranger is eating the wealth. A stranger is taking of the honor. A stranger absorbs the riches. And though the man was given of God all that he wanteth and all that he desireth, it is consumed by the stranger. And this is the evil disease. And it's a common evil. And it's vanity and vexation of spirit, just like most things we're discussing within Ecclesiastes. This evil disease is when that stranger eats of my desire. He eats of my riches. He eats of my wealth. And it's not mine because I have obtained it by any uh, mere uh, you know, doings of my own because I'm puffed up and I'm, I'm full of good works and wow, look at all I've done. It was mine because it was given me. I, I simply received it. And yet God hath not given me at the same time the power to enjoy that, the power to partake of it. That gift is again the good of all my labor. The labors that I have done, the work that I have done, I receive back as a gift. And again, it's God that giveth the strength to gain riches. So I'm not trying to take away from that, but it's plain if you look across. It says, the good of all my labor, in verse 18 of Ecclesiastes 5, the good of all my labor, that's what I'm to enjoy. That's what is good. That is what is comely to the person under God's will and in his domain. The reality here is presented that all of that goodness is here devoured by others. And that is the evil disease. That is the evil that is common among men. And still, though I do all the labor and I do all the work and all I do all the toil so that I should be receiving of the gift of God, which is the portion of my inheritance, that is the fruit of my own labor, the present reality talked about here in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 is that it is devoured by another and that joy is robbed from me. And how much do we see this? day in and day out with our welfare systems, with our social and political systems, with our WSIV. I mean, some of these systems I have paid into for years and years and years and never reap the benefit of it. In fact, sometimes when I go to plug in and to reap the benefit of it, years back when I was actually injured in a car accident, they ended up making me pay back double for it. They made me make, making me pay back for it. My wife had come into hard times when she was younger and she partook of the welfare system. They put you through a course which basically tells you how to to how to reap the system for all it's worth. Here's how you get the most welfare. It's basically how they start you off. But because she went and did it honestly, in the end, she had to, though she had her rent paid that week, two or three weeks later when she got her, her job back and she wasn't laid off anymore by the union, she had to pay it all back in its entirety. And yet people will go and they will reap and they will reap and they will reap and they will reap and they will absorb all that that system has to offer. That's exactly what we're seeing here is God has given riches, wealth, and honor to his people, even to people that are not his people. And yet the stranger is eating of it. The stranger is absorbing that through the social systems that we have today. And so we can work and we can pay, but the only person that's going to benefit is the stranger that's absorbing it. We can try, we can struggle, we can toil, we can put all that we have into our job and into our position, hoping to reap what God has for us. And yet that massive portion I mean, it's not as bad as it is in some countries, but I think we're around 30, 40, upward to 50% once you start having two jobs like I do, where you're giving so much back into these governmental systems, and all they are doing with them is going and blessing and giving joy and encouragement and strength into somebody who hasn't toiled or worked a day in their life. 
These systems, for the most part, though they have their place, and though in your mind you can conceive of how that would be a good thing, unfortunately they become something whereby the wicked just simply leech off of it. And they embrace and enjoy and, and, and soak up all that that system has to offer and all that this produces and more and more and more and more people that are dependent on these very systems. This is socialism at its core. This is the, this is the end game, is that everybody would feed off the government and that hand would constantly be giving and giving and giving and no one's going to bite the hand that feeds you right so when the government starts getting more and more wicked and more and more unrighteous and more and more oppressive in their actions nobody's going to fight it because that's what feeds them no one's going to fight it because that's what gives them and you'll see as the government gets worse these programs get more and more and more uh, beneficial to those that would leech off and you're going to see in the end days that that mark of the beast system is going to be like welfare to the utmost whereby if anyone's not partaking of the system of that social system of that program that the government is offering uh, they're going to die for it <laughs> they're going to give their lives in exchange for not being partakers of that that governmental system so we see here that this is an evil disease and I believe that any country that would embrace such a system whereby they're constantly feeding the least productive in their society, in their nation, they're constantly just giving freebies to those who contribute next to nil, is going to suffer under this disease and the hurt and the harm is going to be apparent. The ruin of this country as the laborers are drained and drained and drained and the lazy bums get more and more and more will become apparent and that country will be brought to ruin when eventually there's nobody there to do the labors. Why? Because it's more beneficial to just take the handout. It's easier to just take the handout. It's easier to just put your hand out and say, whatever you want me to do, government, I'll do it. Just keep that check coming. Keep that food coming. Keep those freebies coming. You want a mark in my right hand or forehead? You got it. I'll be first in line. This is what the world is going to call out, call out for when that day finally comes. So the comparison here is made in verse 3. It says, If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. So here the comparison of the man who is not partaking, not having joy in his own riches, wealth, and honor that God hath given him, uh, it's made in comparison, it's made into likeness, because his soul is not filled with the good that God hath given him. It's made in comparison to an untimely birth. Now remember the Apostle Paul, a familiar passage, he said, I was born as one out of due time. So he listed uh, Paul, James, or he listed uh, James, Cephas, he listed all the apostles, John, as, as they met Christ and as they were, they were brought into the ministry, as they were partakers of the uh, original 12, right? They were brought into the, the company of Christ. And Paul said, I as one born out of due time. Out of due time here we find in this context as well. It just simply means the, the right time would have been before the Apostle Paul was going around beheading and trying to kill all these Christians and slaying them and watching them be stoned and, and hailing men and women out of their houses and, and committing them unto the judges. It was out of due time. It would have been better if he was born within the context of Christ still being alive, Christ still being able to minister unto him in a very personal way. So out of time simply means it's, it's out of the reasonable time. It's out of what you would expect and hope for. So in, in regards to a birth, this could be either premature. Well, what happens when a, when a premature birth happens? Well, again, we're comparing this with the man that is given riches, wealth, and honor, and then the stranger eateth it up, just as one of these government systems where he pays it out, and then the government takes a big portion of it. So it's just like a premature birth, right? So the fear, right? There's fear that comes whenever a child is born early. There's worries about the development not being complete. There's, there's often sorrows and, and sadness and sickness because quite often in a premature birth state, n uh, the, the baby does not live. Uh, in the same way, there, it could be one out of due time could be a post mature birth in which there would be great discomfort to the mom that the child would get big and there's other risks associated with that so the comparison again being made of that man though he live in hundred years and we would all say hey that's that's a great thing if he's living a hundred years and, and his life is blessed and he has many children th this is all good things but if in that time his soul is not filled with the good it's 
better, or it's just like, rather, an untimely birth, being that there is, there's fears, there's worries, there's development concerns, sorrows, sicknesses, stresses, risks, and all those different things that are associated with a premature birth. It's an interesting comparison. I've seen it a few other times in scriptures, and uh, you have to forgive me. I haven't exhausted what that might mean in a picture, but go and study it yourself. It's, it's probably got some really good understandings to it. I also don't understand the fullness of what premature and postmature births actually contribute to, but I have a little bit of experience with Caleb. Regardless, it's not a good thing. It is said it's better for he, uh, it's better an untimely birth than what this man is experiencing. That's not to enjoy the good of his own labor, not to enjoy the gift that God hath bestowed upon him. His soul is not filled with good. And it says also here, it's, it's that, that also if he have no burial. So he's not filled with the good and he's also have no burial. Now is this because the man, the man that's constantly having his, uh, his, his joy ripped away from him by the stranger uh, just did not have the money to afford it? I, I don't know exactly what it means. But, but if he have no burial, again, the premature or the postmature, the untimely birth is better than he. A quick little aside about burials. Now, today the major trend is just to get a cremation done, right? Because it's quick, it's easy, and, and, and it's done like that. And, and the, the plot, it's probably the cheapest method of, of actually uh, using or disposing of a body, I suppose, um, after death. But, but burial as Christians, we need to take as the type that it is. And that is the right thing to do, I believe. And as much as in you is, bury your dead. Because the Bible teaches, first of all, that, that Christ was buried, and there's our greatest example, but how about all the saints, and how about how, how, how much great extent went in the Old Testament? Think of, think of Abraham when Sarah passed away, and the back and forth, an entire chapter of the Bible dedicated to Abraham purchasing that land whereby he could bury his wife in it. And he, he did this great back and forth where he didn't even want to receive the land for less than it was worth. He bartered to pay up. He bartered to give a reasonable amount for it. That's how important it was to have the plot of land in order to put Sarah's body within it. So burial, I believe, is the proper method of disposing or of, of, of laying a body to rest, rather. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 42 pictures the burial as a seed being placed in the earth and says, it is sown in corruption, being the corruptible body, right? It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. And thereby, thereby I believe, again, that that picture is there. You place the seed within the body and that's when the incorruptible comes up for right except a corn of wheat fall to the earth and die and it's the same way that the the man's body dies and lays on the ground and then they place it under the earth six feet other being the traditional way and then eventually in time you'll start to see life sprout out out of it and that's the picture of the resurrection right the same way a seed is placed in the ground and eventually the sprout the green that life will come out of that dead seed is the same way that god expects that his people would be buried and eventually rise again. Now, I don't believe that God can't gather and resurrect a cremated Christian. I, I just, I don't believe that that's without God's control, that he could take the ashes, even if they were scattered all over the place, and bring them together, and that Christian is going to receive the same resurrected body. Uh, God is powerful. God is great. God can do all things. I also don't think God would just put aside all those countless Christians that were burned contrary to their will in torturous uh, crusades of the Roman Catholics and of all other types of governments. You know, even the Calvinists, I don't know if you realize, were burning people at the stake. Um, God is going to be able to resurrect them and give them that same resurrected body we have. I just think that if, if it's in us, the respectful, right and proper way is the burial. Because the Bible describes it here. It says the, the bad thing here associated with the man that lives 100 years, which is great, and has many children, that is great, but if his soul is not filled with good and he have no burial, it says that an untimely birth is better than he. In other words, an untimely birth, which is not a very good thing, is better than the guy that cannot hold on to and embrace and rejoice in his good and also has no proper burial. Just a little aside there. So for more comparison, if you look in verse 5, it says, For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness. 
His name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. So here more comparison is made, that he arrives in vanity, as all do, and he departs in darkness. His name is in that same state where it's clouded by that same darkness. It, it, is, it is associating the fact with this man being in a deep, dark, and depressive state, I believe. Now, <clears throat> it says many times, and we've seen it countless times throughout here, that, that joying or enjoying our own portion and the fruit of our own works is the focus of this life. And though it is vain, and though the majority of what you're going to experience here in life is vanity, I believe that is really just a statement of the contrast to what we're going to experience and rejoice in when we finally reach heaven. There is, there is not much here, and though everything seems very important, and seems very emotionally driven, and seems very special, and seems very wrong, all sorts of emotions are associated with this world. When we look back upon the vapor that is this life, I think the Bible actually says, and to a certain extent, that we shall not much remember the days of this life. We'll put these things behind us because, glory to God, what comes after is what is really what really counts. I believe that reality is beyond in the spiritual realm. Currently, we're, we're trapped in this flesh. We're trapped in something that is sub-real. We're trapped in something, an experience that is not great, that is not good, that is not the highest of what the experiential life uh, will have for us. And thereby... And by the way, that applies for both. I, I, the experiences and the emotions, what's coming beyond for the spiritual body, whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell, is all going to be heightened. Some of us everlasting joy, some of us everlasting contempt, the Bible says, will be experienced. But regardless, the vanity of this life, we will not much think upon these things, for they have passed. And this is why I think God brings the focus into a, a precise Thing, that's your just to labor and rejoice in the fruits of your labor. Labor and rejoice in the fruits of your labor. Because this life is vanity. And how much more is it vanity when, like it says in verse or chapter 6 here, this joy that is what you're supposed to experience is actually robbed from you. That's why it's a sore travail. That's why it's an evil disease. That's why it's something, unfortunately, that is common to all men, that that joy is constantly being robbed from us. Verse 6 says this. It says, Yea, though he live a thousand years, twice told, yet hath, not, hath he seen no good, do not all go to one place. All the labor of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? So even if we were to take this life where he is receiving of all of this riches and wealth and honor, if that joy is continually robbed from him, though he have a thousand years to told, though he have two thousand years to live, it does not change the fact that this is vanity. Your lifespan may increase, but if your lifespan is long and joyless, it's vanity, just as much as it is vanity now. The wise here, I believe, are the ones that receive the gift of their labors that are put forth. And though they are robbed, there is that great equalizer that comes over and spreads out the wise and the fool as they walk and as they live before the living that basically sets us all at the same playing field, right? Rich or poor. But the difference is always going to be, can you find joy where you're at? Can you rejoice where you're at? Whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you have everything that you need or whether you have nothing, what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? We need to understand that no matter what position we're at, we need to find the joy. And our joy is in Jesus. This is why the world has such trouble with joy, has such darkness within their life, because their life is just as vain as ours. Honestly, the only thing that we can gain here in this life as believers is more believers. We can take Christians with us. We can take lost people, get them saved, and bring them with us. But the day-to-day -day mundane everything, you know, the things you do to eat, the things you do when you go to bed, the things that you do with your family, most of this stuff is just going to be burned up. There's going to be nothing left of it. But we need to find joy that is in Jesus so that when we are doing the mundane, we are content therewith, we are happy, we are rejoicing in the gift of God which he giveth us. What's being described here is exactly what socialism brings. It is another reason why I know that the socialist 
uh, setup is not of God. Though there are Christians out there now that are lifting up Adolf Hitler as something great and fantastic, as if he had the perfect system that was going to even elevate Christians and, and live this Christian life and, and push forth Christianity across the world, whole world. It's foolishness. Socialism is, simply robs them of, robs all of us of, the rightful thing that God is describing here, and that's that we would work and rejoice in our labors. It's been said that socialism is just the next step unto communism. So even though Christians are jumping on board with this socialism is the way to live, um, I believe it was tried in the Bible and it failed miserably. This is why they discontinued. If you look in the early pages of the book of Acts, you find the Christians there, uh, out of a right heart, out of a sincere heart, coming together and having all things in common. And they didn't do that for very long. And that's probably a good reason for that, because that's the beginnings of communism, when everybody's just going to come in and just spread things all abroad and just share and live in that way. It is not a sustainable system. It's not a system that is ever going to work for a prolonged period. Now, in their situation, I believe that they're all under persecution. They're feared for their lives, and so they banded together for a short while. That worked. But I believe after a while, they were able to get back, you know, Paul into tent making and others into different jobs that they did as, as, in order to raise their families and, and live the, the mundane, the everyday lifestyle. But for a long and sustainable thing, socialism just does not work. What I believe would be best would be a free market capitalism where, just like it says in Ecclesiastes, men can work and enjoy the good of their own labor, and they would be free to do so. But what that needs to be all underneath is the blanket of a benevolent dictator. And the best one is God Almighty, obviously. The perfect system is going to be whereby we can work to enjoy the fruits of our labor under the benevolent, you know, good for you dictator that's overseeing everything and rules with an iron fist. And that's going to be what we will eventually come to. But in the meantime, in this vain life, I believe Ecclesiastes, again, uh, Solomon here, is trying to give us a perspective that he has seen it all. He has lived it all. He has had it all. And he was the wisest man that ever lived upon the face of the earth next to Jesus Christ. And when he looked back at all of it, he said, it's vain. So you need to take joy in your labors. Rejoice in the gifts that God giveth you, even the days that he's given you while you live here. And that's how you have to live, day by day, moment by moment by moment. Yes, you're going to be robbed. And there's going to be some times when God just does not give you the ability. He does not give you the power to eat of that same fruit of your labor. Because what? A stranger swipes it and takes it away from you. But when he, in the previous chapter, does give it for you, you can see that, that it's, it's uh, the same feeling, the same reaction. That's joy would be filling your heart. But you would, you would live it out in a different mentality where you actually get and partake of. We're going to both live both with Paul. Boss Paul said, um, I know how to be both exalted and how to be abased. He, he had to live even within his lifespan in both uh, contrary reasons, both contrary uh, modes of his lifestyle. And we need to do that the same. Why? Because our joy is always going to be in Christ. And if it's settled and it's established in Christ, then we can float up and down within uh, what you would call the tax brackets or whatever. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can have everything, you can have nothing, and you're still going to find that rejoicing in Christ. Verse 9 says this, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So what if seen, therefore, is better than the wandering desire? What happens is that men tend to work for the tangibles. They tend to get a hold of something, and they purchase it, and then they have it. And, and, and that's good, and that's right. If it brings you joy, and it's the right kind of the joy. But across the board, what is wrong here is when we focus less upon what is seen and start to focus more upon what is, is basically not tangible or is not seen. If you see it with the eyes, and the Bible said in another place that... Um, uh, 5 verse 11 across the page, it said, um, What good is there to the owners thereof, saving to the beholding of them with their eyes? And that was the riches that they had. So it's better to have those things than to have the wandering of the eyes. So if you do work hard and you, and you gain and you grow and you're able to buy a little bit bigger of a house, you're able to buy a little bit, bit nicer of a car, and all those things come to you, it's better to have those things in the sight 
than the wandering of the desire. And what the wandering of the desire is, is the person that does not have those things, and yet gets drawn into wanting those things, which is covetousness. Both of these are vanity and vexation of spirit. Both of these need to be uh, dealt with in their right way and in their right mode. But the bottom line here, I believe, is speaking to the fact that we need to appreciate what we have. When we have it, and it's, it's seen in the sight of the eyes, when it's in your eyes, you behold it, you embrace it, you have it, that's good, that's fine, but appreciate it rather than, than letting your eyes wander to the next thing and to the next thing and to the next thing and always trying to gain and grow in that way. Verse 10, that which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. The contentions then cease after we realize this. That which is, hath been is named already, and it is man. So he's been talking about men, talking from the perspective of men, talking about how men work, how men operate, knowing what it was to be a king born in the castle, and knowing what it was to begin at the bottom and work his way up. This is all just a tale of men. It says, neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. And I think that it's just kind of accentuating the fact, given all that we've talked about, that the contentions will cease when we stop looking at those that are mightier than us. Verse 11, it says, Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? What does he gain? What does he grow by? There's almost a rhetorical question here. Is there really even an answer to this? It seems that vanity here we see gives hurt, gives harm, but we have also learned how the Lord wants us to navigate this vain life in a certain manner, in a certain way. So what are we the better if we do or if we don't? Well, the answer here is given in verse 12. It says, For who knoweth what is good for man in this life all the days of, this, or of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow? For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So the answer to that question is, is, is how could we grow or how do we gain or what, what's even the benefit of living this vain life the way God says? Well, the answer is here. It's, it's because God said it. The answer is of the Lord. And so because God knows what is good for a man, because God lays out what is good for a man, we can expect that if we follow it, though we don't understand that we're spending this life as a shadow and what that all means, and we don't understand what shall come after us, we need to understand that the Lord God does understand all these things. So he knows what's coming after. He knows what's after the, this vanity of life. He knows what will follow after each and every man as we taketh this life under the sun. So therefore, simply God putting it forward is the answer for question number 11. God sets it out and says, hey, this is how I want you to live. And what is man the better? Does it matter? No, it doesn't because God said it. So though we won't increase and we don't understand why we're stuck here in this life, vain as the next guy, stuck here in this life, trapped just as the next guy, just running through the courses, spinning our wheels seemingly, trying to have joy yet sometimes finding our joy robbed from us, whether God hath given us the power or hath not given us the power. He is in control of all these things and he knoweth what is good for man in this life. Isn't that a great lesson to learn that God knows what's good for you? And, and, and at the times when you think you're really increasing, you're really doing great, and then you fall and you're at the bottom and you're depressed, God knew what was good for you at both pinnacles. He knows what is right, and in this vain life, His way is the best. So the answer of the Lord is this, and it has been throughout this whole passage. It's work hard. It's enjoy the fruits. It's trust in the Lord and understand that He knows best. Understand that He is in control of all of it, because we already just saw he is the one that either giveth you the ability and the power to enjoy the good, or he giveth it not to you. But either way, it was given in the first place, and joy is the constant in one place or another. We need to rejoice in what we have. We need to rejoice in what we've earned through works. We need to rejoice first and foremost in God Almighty. We need to rejoice in Christ, and that's how men ought to live this vain life.